All right, so um, we are going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the different purchasing cycle um, and how we can control cost in each stage of that cycle. Um, first, we need to understand what the purchasing cycle is. And with this purchasing cycle, we start with our purchasing stage, and then we move on to receiving, where we actually receive the product, we store it, we put it into inventory, and then once we issue it, then it becomes part of our food cost, okay? The cost of doing business. While it's still in our storage, it's not necessarily part of our food cost, we still paid for the product, but it's not part of our food cost. In a later chapter, we will actually talk about um, how we calculate what our actual food cost is. Now we have two different types of products. Um, one, is called directs and one is called stores okay essentially what happens is directs go from receiving directly into production and stores go from receiving and we put them into storage things like um, dairy products baked goods um, highly perishable items, those are things that are gonna go directly into production um, from our receiving dock into, um, into the kitchens. Whereas our canned goods, our frozen goods, things like that are gonna go into our storage. So it's important for us to understand who should buy and what they need to be buying, okay? And so, um, people should be trained. We should not just let anybody purchase the food because what happens is we might run out of food if we don't order enough. We might order too much food and then the product goes bad. Um, and so through training, those people who have been trained are the ones who should actually just be buying the food, okay? Because we know they know what to buy. In addition to quantities, we also have product specifications, okay? So quantities and the quality of our products, okay? And so, for example, our Apple type, the, F the Fuji Apple, um, it's organic, it's a grade fancy, it's a red apple, it's 100% mature, we're getting ready to use it, and 10, point, uh, 10 to 13 ounces, and it's a fresh apple. Those are all different quality specifications. The quantity specification is the fact that it comes in a 15 pound case. So the person who's ordering knows that these are the, speci the specific specifications of this apple that we need. Now, when we're, let's kind of talk about apples. So if we have um, apples, now if we are using um, a buffet at a, bre a breakfast buffet at a hotel, okay, um, and we just want to put apples out there, is there any kind of substitutions that might be appropriate instead of Fuji apples? We might be able to use Granny Smith, might be able to use Red Delicious, we might be able to use Pink Lady, um, whatever kind of other type of apple, we might be looking at just more from a cost perspective of what is, you know, the cheapest apple to buy at that specific time, especially if it's in season. Now, if we're making apple pies, we may want to only use those green apples, the Granny Smith apples, because they're, they have that tart flavor and they have the, the consistency that it's going to hold up when we actually bake a pie. So understanding the product substitutions is also really important. So when we're going to establish our par level, essentially what we need to do is we need to take our daily usage and how often we order. Once we have these two things, then we can have, get an idea of what our par level is going to be. So let's say we have three bottles of wine, and we use three bottles of wine per day, okay? And there's four days 
between our deliveries. That means our par, which is the minimum amount that we need on hand in order to um, operate, is 12 bottles. You need to have 12 bottles. Well, some days we might use more than three, we might use less than three, kind of just depends on the volume. So three is our average daily usage, but what we can do is also include a safety factor. Typically, it's in the form of a percentage, and so if we multiply by 0.1, that means we need to have a safety factor, just in case we get busier on one day, um, of an extra 1.2 bottles. Now, of course, we would not call Cisco or Specs and say, hey, or Specs really, because Cisco doesn't do wine, but hey, Specs, I need 13.2 bottles of wine. That wouldn't work. So we would actually round that up to 12 or two bottles. And so we would actually order 14 bottles of wine, okay, to include that safety factor. That's essentially how we figure out what is our par level. And so for every ingredient item, that we have, we need to have an, an established par so that we know how much to order. Here's an example of a par sheet. So we have five different types of meat. In this case, let's first look at our prime rib. So our prime rib, our par is four, and we go into our inventory and I see that I have two prime ribs already. So I don't need to buy those two because my, I, my, the purpose of purchasing is to get me up to par. And so we take our par and we subtract what we have in inventory and that gives us our amount to order. Okay, so my par is four. I have two in inventory, so I should only order two. Okay, on Thursday, you'll see that my par is six. So your par can be different because right now I'm just ordering enough to get me through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But on Thursday, I got to get to the weekend. And so the weekend gives me, I need to have six par in inventory. I have two, so I should buy four. Okay. Now, follow, then following Monday, my inventory, my par is still four. But actually in inventory, I have three prime ribs. So for whatever reason, I didn't use all the prime rib that I had ordered that I thought I was going to. And so I only need to order one. Now come Thursday, my par is six and I go in and we had a really busy week. There was maybe there's a special event that was happening and my par, my inventory is zero, which means I need to order all six to get back up to par, okay? To get back up to my par. Understanding the needs of the organization um, can help also shape how we purchase items. If we have limited storage, we might have to purchase more frequently and have more deliveries um, because we don't have enough space to store all the product that we need. We're going to look at four different types of purchasing methods. The first one is prime vendor. When I work in Maine at the Acadia Institute of Oceanography, I primarily use the prime vendor of the uh, performance food group and so there are companies similar to Cisco and Benny Keith and essentially what I do is they were the prime vendor I ordered about 95 percent of my product from performance food group okay um, then we also have competitive quotes and so our competitive quotes with the competitive quotes it's a little bit more challenging because you have to have your detailed specifications for every single item. And then you send that information out to Benny Keith, to Cisco, to Joe's Produce, to Mike's Meat, whatever, whatever the vendor is. And they give you a competitive quote on what they would charge. And then you would actually select the vendor based on who has the lowest quote, who has the lowest price. It takes a lot of time. Um, and, and the more vendors you have, the more paperwork's involved, the harder it is to keep track. So all these have pros and cons to figure out 
what uh, is the best method, okay? The other one I wanna talk about is our standing order method. Standing order is typically used with dairy products, bakery goods, so I'm a coffee shop. I might have a standing order of 24 croissants um, every day. And so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you bring me 24 croissants in the morning. An issue with sending orders is that every day I'm gonna get 24 croissants. And so if I only sell 10 the day before, then I have 14 for the day before, plus my extra 24, and now I have 38 croissants to sell, okay? And so sending orders, if you don't price, if you don't um, arrange them appropriately, then you might end up with excessive product, okay? Um, the La Quinta where I worked, we had kind of a modified standing order where they knew what our, um, they knew what our par level was for different dairy products. So like in a little snack shop right next to the front desk, we had the little Oak Farm dairies, uh, chocolate milk, strawberry milk, and regular milk. And they knew what our par was. So they would come in and get us up to par and then only charge us for what they actually replenished. So that's kind of like a modified sending order where they came in on specific days of the week but then they would only get us, only charge us for what they did to get us up to par. The last one I want to talk about is commissary. So, you know, in class we've talked about, um, uh, Lindsay talked about Bakery Lorraine has a commissary system set up. And so with the commissary, um, all the product is made at one location and then distributed to other satellite locations. Um, the other example that was discussed in class was Bill Miller Barbecue. So everything's made at Bill Miller, and then the different restaurants kind of place their order um, from the commissary, and that, all that product is distributed out to the different locations. So as we choose a vendor, it's important for us to understand, again, what the needs are for the organization. Um, some vendors like Betty Keith or Cisco, they require a minimum purchase amount. So if I'm a smaller restaurant, I may not be able to um, accommodate a large $10,000 order every time a delivery is made. So in that case, I might have to go to Cisco, no, sorry, um, Sam's or Costco or somewhere in order to uh, get the product that I need. It may even be HEB. And so really as an owner, as a manager of a restaurant, it's important to understand what the needs are. Um, obviously, the more you can buy in bulk, the less expensive the items are going to be, and it will help you with the cost, okay? Um, if you work for a big you know, franchise or a corporate place like Starbucks or McDonald's or Burger King or anything, any place like that, fast food chain, then they have a specific ordering process, um, and they have a specific vendor that it's already you're already gonna buy the product from. So when we're talking about choosing a vendor, this is primarily at that independent restaurant level. So the purchase order is done in-house in the restaurant. Um, so with this purchase order, we're gonna have a purchase order number that we can always reference. This is part of that filing and keeping track of information. Then we have the name of the restaurant, the date of the purchase order, okay? The, the date that the order was purchased. Um, the person who is placing the order will sign the purchase order. That way we can track it back to, if, any, if we have any questions about something, we know the person that we can track it back to. We definitely want to have the supplier's name and address, especially if we have multiple suppliers. What the delivery date, any special instructions, all of that goes on that purchase order. We send that with every single item um, to that the vendor and then they generate the shipment and then they generate an in invoice, okay? So with the it, each items that are being processed, we have our quantity, the unit cost, which is the cost for one unit, and then we have the extended cost. And the extended cost essentially is the quantity times the unit cost. So let's say I buy one case, or sorry, one case of eggs is nine dollars and i order four cases then my extended cost is going to be 36 dollars 
That's how that extended cost works, okay? We add up the extended cost for all of our ingredients and we get that total cost of the order. It's important for us to make sure that whoever is receiving the order, this gentleman right here, has the purchase order in hand because they're going to check this purchase order against what is actually being delivered, okay? So if I order 100 pounds of beef at 9.50 a pound, but my shipper decides to send me 200 pounds at $11 per pound, well then the issue that I have is I have too much waste and my books are gonna be off because I thought I was gonna be paying 9.50 when in reality I'm paying an extra dollar and 50 cents per each pound of beef, okay? And so that's why it's important that this delivery person, um, they have the copy of the invoice and this purchase or the, the receiver at the organization is going to keep that purchase order on hand to compare the numbers. So this is the basic purchasing uh, doc documents within the entire purchasing cycle. Most restaurants and organizations are going to have requisition forms first, especially if there's multiple outlets. So if there's a multiple restaurants or bars or things like that, each one's going to have a requisition form. And then they send that to our purchasing department where they will actually compile all those requisition forms and per create one purchasing order for the entire establishment. <clears throat> So this is the business, and then this is the vendor. The vendor actually creates the invoice, okay? The receiving report would be an example where, you know, we check off everything on that invoice as it is delivered. We submit it back to our purchasing department so that they, or our um, accounting office, so they can actually then process the payment for that, okay? Um, it's really, really important that we have good record keeping base, um, because we want to make sure that our bills are being paid and that we're receiving the orders. As soon as we sign that invoice upon delivery, that product is ours. And so we have to make sure that what we are receiving is what we're actually ordering so that we pay for that product. Okay. So you can see right here, there's an example of a schedule. So our produce company, we order and deliver on the same day, okay? And the order is due by 6 p.m. and we're gonna get a delivery that same day, okay? So by, by 6 p.m. on midnight, or by 6 p.m. on that day, and then we'll get a delivery in the morning. So whatever I order on Monday is gonna be delivered on Tuesday, okay? And then the meat supplier, by midnight, I need to get in by Monday night, my midnight, I need to get my order in and the delivery is gonna come in on Tuesday. So a perfect example of this is Cheshire's Hamburgers where I used to work um, in high school. Each night after we closed, the manager would actually take an inventory of how, many, how much beef we had, how many hamburger patties we had. And then they had a specific par they needed to get to and they would order that that night. And then on Tuesday, we would get a delivery um, of the fresh meat. So we wanna put that down at the bottom and use all the older stuff first um, and then get the newer stuff as, as we go on throughout the day, okay? And so this is how that ordering schedule can work. So one time, well, one item that we haven't really talked talk about right now is our lead issue. We'll discuss it right now. Our lead time, is essentially the time between when we order it and when we receive it. That's the usage of that time. And so essentially our, our, our original ordering formula was just simple par minus our inventory. So if I had par minus our inventory, then that tells me I need to order 26 bottles. Okay. But if I just ordered 26 bottles, then by the time I place the order on Monday a.m. and it's delivered on Wednesday a.m., there's Tuesday in between. There's I'm going to use product. And so in this process, as you're calculating the lead time usage, I want you to think of if it says when, if it says the morning, that is before we open for the day. 
If it says PM, which you'll see in the next slide, then that is when we've closed for the day, we're done with business. And so in this case, we're gonna have product on Tuesday. And because we're placing our order Monday morning before we open, that means all day Monday, we are also going to be using product. So our daily use of lead time is actually two days. And then our daily usage is 10 bottles. So my lead time usage is actually 20 bottles. So because I'm going to use this, I need to now add 20 bottles to my order. And so I should order 46 bottles. Because if I did not if I did not take into account this daily usage, again, the point of purchasing is when that truck drops off the product that I am back up to par. And so if I don't take into account these 20 bottles, then I'm gonna use them. And when that truck comes in, they bring me 26 bottles. Well, I'm gonna be short some. So let's look at the example. Okay, um, our par is 500. And our inventory is 200, so I need to subtract those. And so I need to order 300 pounds. Well, let's figure out what our usage time is, our lead time. So I order it on Tuesday p.m. And I deliver it on, thir it's delivered on Thursday a.m. So Tuesday p.m., I'm not, my business is done for the day. So I am gonna do business on Wednesday. Thursday a.m. means my delivery comes before I open, and so I don't need to worry about that day. So my one day is my lead time, and my usage is 150 pounds. Okay, so because I'm going to use that, I need to replace that, I should actually order 450 pounds. So let me do a quick illustration for you. My par is 500, so each one of these represents 100 pounds. I go into my inventory and I see that I only have 200 pounds in inventory. So if I were to order right here 300 pounds, well, come Thursday morning, I'm gonna use one and a half of my products, and so I'm only going to have 350 pounds. But by taking into account this lead time usage, let's say our lead time usage is yellow, I'm going to replace that and order one, two, three, four hundred and fifty pounds. And so when I order all 450 pounds, then when it comes down to it, when that truck drops off my order, I now am back up to par at 500 pounds. That is how this lead time usage, and this is why it's so important to accommodate for that.